Hello, hello, hello. Hey, everybody. We're back. It's we been finally back. Wild. Yeah. It's How long has been it been, Michelle? Months. I think <laughs> the last time we, came, well, besides us sharing what was going on inside the transitioning of the SOS Club, I think the last time we were on was when I was in St. Croix, and that was like July. Whoa. Okay. So, so that, and there's been reasons for it too. Yes. I am. September, October, August, September, October, November. Four months prego. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> That's almost halfway there. See, I know. Do you, when? What's the math? Like, uh, I'm spring. doing May. May. Spring. So with most pregnant women, the first three months, you feel like garbage. So for that reason, we have not done the show. <laughs> <laughs> and then it took another month to just kind of get back into the schedule like we would plan on doing the show and then Amy would be like I'm here and I'd be like I'm napping <laughs> <laughs> oh but now we are back um so yes it, the first three months was very nauseous and you don't feel like eating anything but you got to eat otherwise you feel like throwing up and it's it's you just kind of scale back and get through it and then go back to your normal life so now i'm back to normal life and it's life didn't didn't stop i just took a little break well we took a little break i'm sure that you know we, it's always nice to take a break we never feel like oh my gosh we ruined everything because you took a break um part of our oh, things always get better when you yes. take a break yeah we are different people now than we were when we recorded our last episode yeah, so, yeah. a whole quarter ago <laughs> yeah. a lot has happened no like almost half a year no quarter that's fine that's <laughs> right it was a quarter yeah a lot has changed so in your the first trimester is really like a winter period isn't it yeah you? you kind of hibernate you kind of hate the world <laughs> Well, not really. You just hate the feeling like, like I, I was talking to Amy about this. It's like, you never realize how much the joy of eating and the love for food is tied to the joy for living and the love for life. Mm -hmm. Like those things are like this. And when you don't feel like eating and you don't feel like cooking and you can't even stand to think about, oh my gosh, what am I going to eat for breakfast, lunch, or dinner? it affects life like it feels like you can't enjoy your life so i'm like now i'm back in the kitchen making all kinds of things making frittatas making all kinds of like we made this epic thanksgiving feast and i was taking recipes out of bon appetit magazine and it's like i'm back thank wow. goodness <laughs> yeah you're inspired again and enjoying like the beauty of food and using your senses and it's, yes. it's really important actually especially for women, I think we need to feel inspired and we need to be like, have our senses lit up in mm -hmm. order to feel like we're living. Mm -hmm. For some women, it's tied to being able to cook in your kitchen and enjoy it. For other women, you, you enjoy more when other people are serving you. So it's, you know, it all, you know, food is like a big thing for everyone. And it's, if you ever go through a time where you, you used to have a great appetite and then your appetite's gone, you realize, wow, that was actually important. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. I also have been enjoying food more recently. I've come yeah. out of a phase of, it's, it's like maybe I have some kind of empathy going like across the seas for whatever mm -hmm. you're going through. I'm not yeah. pregnant, but I'm going <laughs> through it. <laughs> and um, so yeah, for me, I went through a period a long period of uh, like going deep into health and how to optimize my body. And, and it really was a way to recover from an eating disorder, which I, mm -hmm. I had a few years ago. And, and that helped. It really helped me to exit that. Mm -hmm. But it's still this like um, obsession with what's healthy and what's right and what I should and shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. It was just taking over my life. And in the last, few months during your first trimester I sort of rediscovered food again and like relaxed and just let myself eat whatever I want 
basically. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is my body. And then i um, recently been enjoying like cooking nice things for myself and for others and getting back yeah. into that kind of communal feeling like entertaining and just, oh, it's just wonderful. It's Yes. Especially it's when you work from home, yeah. like being able to, like loving being able to go and cook something and sit down and eat it. It's the only way we really take a break. Yeah. When we work from home, it's like the only way to like stop work and do something else that you're just like totally in the moment. It's mm -hmm. not work related. It's a way, I mean, it's, it's an act of self care really. And maybe mm -hmm. it's not, I don't know if I could commit to cooking something beautiful every day, but I did have a shift the other day when uh, Mateo was away on business. So I was alone in the house. And normally when this happens, I would be like, ah, Shall I just like eat that tomato? Just like munch into it? Like, do I need to do anything to it? I don't know. Maybe I'll just make a smoothie or something. But this time I thought, no, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to show myself that I'm worthy of being treated uh, in a beautiful way. I'm going to make myself a special meal. I'm going to mm -hmm. have a sort of like date with myself. Yeah. And so then I made these amazing meatballs and I had some, I had a glass of red wine and, and then in the end I decided to invite my sister over to enjoy oh, wow. it with me. And I just, and it was like an impromptu thing, but it was really nice to treat myself well. It reminded mm -hmm. me of what we, what we spoke about in Planet Girl one. In fact, you need to write this story for the next issue of Planet Girl magazine. Oh yeah, like you are worthy and to you are worthy of a beautiful meal just because just because mm -hmm. like you yeah. don't have it's not always I can imagine about like when else. was the last time for I'm talking to people who actually enjoy cooking, not people mm -hmm. who are like I actually hate it blah, blah blah. It's like don't worry if you hate it then that's your style. You're not you're not supposed to force yourself to love it. No. But if you do love it and you kind of slipped into feeling like every meal is predictable and just throw it together like when was the last time you created a beautiful mutton meatball spaghetti thing <laughs> like, yeah did it like i when i got on the zoom call with amy just now she was not sitting there because we were kind of like timing it wrong timing it off and so i came on first and i'm looking at her beautiful apartment and I say, hello, and I can hear Amy <laughs> <laughs> battering to the computer. And she's like, hold on, I'm just making spaghetti. <laughs> like, I'm trying a new recipe. I'm trying beef instead of mutton this time. And like, what is mutton? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing, though. <laughs> it's like, uh, the only time I hear or read the word mutton is in like an old 1800s book <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's that's another thing that's uh it's been a big thing for me is like transitioning from eating no meat to introducing mm -hmm. some meat into my diet and really going deep into looking for like really well sourced grass-fed high yeah. high standards organic stuff Mm -hmm. and eating much less than perhaps I would have done before I turned vegetarian mm -hmm. um, like maybe just once or twice a month but it's a super special occasion on those yeah. moments yeah 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 I, I start I um, was scrolling on Facebook the other day and I came across this ad for something called misfits market something like that where it's <clears throat> a service that takes to be imperfect vegetables and fruit and produce of gr groceries and farms that won't sell or they know they won't sell so they don't put it in the groceries and they don't display it at the farm whatever and they make it available as a subscription service at a discount organic fresh produce for people who don't care that their carrot looks weird or their potato is like the a wonky carrot <laughs> Or there are one of those carrots that has an extra leg sticking yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I subscribe because I 
don't want to spend more than I have to for organic produce just because it looks perfect. It's mm -hmm. like, I don't need it to look perfect. So I signed up, we got our first box a couple of weeks ago. It was great. And it's a huge box of fruit and vegetables. And we went through it in a week. Mm. And I was like, that's, it, 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 I was making soups, I was making roasted things. And it was, it wasn't hard to eat all of that. And it just makes you realize how if you had, if you had more of that in your house, and you had this love of cooking, it kind of like elevates uh, cooking and eating because I was just so excited to try new recipes. I posted a picture in the SOS club of me roasting this acorn squash. I'd never made acorn squash before in my life. Like that's the other thing. There's so many things in the grocery store you don't pick up because you just never picked it up before. Yeah. But because here it's I am not in your, in your usual things. pattern of like where yeah. you stop and yeah. So that's something I like about subscription boxes is mm -hmm. because you'll try things you wouldn't have tried otherwise. Mm -hmm. And also it allows me to make baby food for Noah. Well, I don't really make baby food. He eats what we eat, but now it's organic. So it's like, and like I, I signed up after I like was coming out of first trimester and started to be interested in food again. And it's just so cool how there are all of these ways that we can explore love of life in the kitchen more mm -hmm. I was I used to be subscribed to a subscription that was that's called taste the world and they would that's each good. month or each couple of months focus on a different part of the world and send you like unique spices and sauces and things and like recipes and like the things you made from that were the best things I ever had and I would never have picked it up in the grocery store Yes. So it's, it's just, it just goes on and on and on if you're willing to like explore um, <clears throat> the love of the joy for cooking. Like even Thanksgiving, we, we uh, made recipes from Bon Appetit magazine, one of my favorite magazines. And Miguel made the turkey with the recipe and it was the best turkey I have ever had <laughs> in my life life <laughs> I was like why don't we investigate how to do something better like why do we make the same turkey every year and yet if we follow a recipe of people who actually like it's your job to make the best recipe they can come up with for Thanksgiving that year to put in their, their magazine it's like we just we just loved it it was like we or there was only me and Miguel for Thanksgiving and we made all the food <laughs> And we ate all the food. It took a week, <laughs> but we ate everything because it was so delicious. So, yeah, a lot of culinary adventures going on over here. Mm, so maybe we could have a challenge in the next magazine, which is like a culinary mm. date with yourself. Ooh, I love it. Okay, writing that down. Yes. Post-it note. The yeah. next challenge, Planner Girl <laughs> Magazine, culinary date. Because our challenges are all about how to value yourself and how to feel like you're worth it. You can do this for yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we love, what, we love it when people, like the challenge is something people can share. So we've had lots of people take the, the buy yourself flowers challenge and then post it on Instagram and tag us. So I can just totally picture people saying, look what I made for dinner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Show, show us your pictures of your date with yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm fun anyway, anyway. The, the thing that i would love to talk about is something amy just brought up she had an epiphany around i don't know what i'm doing i don't know what i'm doing take it away amy <laughs> <laughs> so as michelle said it has been a while since we've recorded an episode of the michelle and amy show and a person can change over the course of a few months. And one of the new projects that I've been working on is developing an art store where I'll be selling my art prints. And this has just been really a lifelong dream of mine that I have shoved away in the corner <laughs> or under the rug, under the cupboard, just as far away as I possibly can because it's really like a thing that, I, that matters to me and 
it's much easier to do things that don't matter <laughs> that don't they don't matter as much where it doesn't feel yeah. like your personal mm-hmm. essence is on the line <laughs> and um but i i it just always comes back it's one of those things that just nudges me all the time whenever yeah. i'm at a crossroads whenever i'm having a health issue whenever anything really comes up and you when you have those moments of pause and you check in you're like what is going on? Something is off. There's always that voice in the back of my head saying, make your art, make your art, make some art. Um, and so the other day I was doing one of those future visioning exercises where you tune into your future self and you ask her for advice. You just, you see what it is that she is exuding, giving off and what, what is she creating? And you sort of ask her, What's, what should I do about this? And she was like, you need to make art. Just don't worry about anything else, it's fine. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, this wasn't the answer that I was looking for because I was looking for some answers about printables, but okay. <laughs> um, so finally, I made the commitment and it just takes a commitment, right? Like that's it. It felt like a huge deal, but in the end it was like, we're gonna do this now, I'm committed whatever happens I'll find a way to make it work and as a result this last couple of weeks I've been I've been making sort of pulling together artworks preparing packaging sort of learning about what it is that I need to do and the logistics of it of a physical products store having been in printables for a really long time it's a it's a shock (laughs) printables are so amazing because you could just send the file and it's like Oh yeah, there's so much involved. And so I have found myself saying constantly, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. And sometimes, I mean, I tend to say it in the, in the low moments, in the sort of the moments of the roller coaster when you're going downwards. Mm-hmm. And on this particular occasion yesterday, Matteo, my partner, was like, can you stop saying that? <laughs> Enough. Enough saying, I don't know what I'm doing. It's so disempowering. And being a bit of a Does rebel. Does he speak, in, speak to you in Italian ever? Sometimes. Not often. No. I mean, he swears in Italian. <laughs> It'd so be some... funny if he was like... That was not Italian. <laughs> No, but he, he does in, when we're in Italy, he does. Yeah. He, he has these modes. There's English Matteo mode and Italian Matteo mode. And it switches when you cross the border, <laughs> when he gets off the plane. So uh, it's the same thing with Miguel. When we go to Chicago around his Mexican family, he's like all of a sudden speaking Spanish. When we're away, he never speaks Spanish. So it's like, two different people (laughs) yeah well yes did you ever have a moment like hearing Miguel speak Spanish and thinking like whoa this person who I'm spending my life with grew up speaking a different language like full-on thinking in a different language and like I had a moment like that I looked at Mateo and I was like I don't know you (laughs) I'm like I'm like wow you're bilingual (laughs) like that's an accomplishment for people in America not Many of us can speak two lo- two languages. Mm. It, and it's it's really like it opens up like such a rich range for self expression. There's so mm-hmm. many things that are that just the English language can't express. Mm-hmm. This is like very special ways to express things in Italian that just don't exist in English. It's like, wow. Yeah. But anyway, we digress. <laughs> so no, he wasn't. He wasn't. Um, Scolding getting you frustrated in Italian. In Italian. <laughs> this was in English. And actually, he is not this animated either. He'll, he'll tend to say things in a very gentle, quiet way. Half of the time, I can't hear what he's saying. But this time, it was like, can you please stop saying that? It's so <laughs> disempowering. And I, being a bit of a rebel, I don't like it when people tell me what to do or when they tell me not to do something and I immediately snapped and i was like you are assuming that i don't know what i'm doing is a negative thing and it is not a negative thing i'll have you know um and just but 
Were you talking to Matteo or were you talking to yourself? To myself, really, yeah. So most of the time, Matteo is facilitating these like realizations. Yes, <laughs> to myself, exactly. That was like future Amy kicked in and was just like, hey, you need to start owning this phrase. It's not a bad thing. So half the time, we may, we may be saying something which seems disempowering on the surface, but there is a new way to look at it and a way, to, a way to flip it so that it can really be empowering, it can work in your favor. And I don't know what I'm doing. It reminded me of when I was in fashion school and in this particular fashion school, they had a real emphasis on creativity but not technical ability. So we were not taught how to do any of the technical things at all. It was, more, it was just, you figured it out, you improvised, you found a way to make it happen, but nobody's gonna teach you the proper way to do it. And mm -hmm. I remember we had one project which was very much focused on pattern cutting. So in fashion, pattern cutting is the uh, practice of creating like maps for the clothing on paper that then wrap around the body and become amazing clothes. I remember the first time when I saw like a shirt laid out flat as a map, I was like, my mind was blown. <laughs> this idea that you, you can take these flat pieces of fabric and then like mold mm -hmm. them to the body somehow, it was really very magical. And so we, we had this pattern cutting project. We were given these sketches and like make it. So I freaked out. I freaked out because I didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue. I was really a person and still am really who likes to draw and paint. And I like to make sketchbooks and the, all the creative side of things. But I, I have no, <laughs> I really struggle when it comes to like the technical background. And there's such a rich history of craftsmanship in the pattern cutting world. It just goes back. Uh, mm -hmm. centuries and centuries that I was like oh my god I'm just I'm going to be doing a disservice to like centuries of <laughs> amazing designers and oh and but it, it with the time frame that we had there wasn't enough time for me to learn pattern cutting from scratch I had a book mm -hmm. I opened it it was like full of very complex things I was like oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. there's not enough time for, I can't become a master in the next week so what am I going to do I just shut the book and decided to do what I could do, which was draping and just chucking stuff on the mannequin and cutting and like pinning, just tweaking in a very sort of human way, sort of approaching it more like a sculptor than someone who knows what they're doing with, with uh, pattern cutting equipment. And I was so terrified when it came to the day of the crit. It's called crit, which I guess is like a critique. Mm. and it's judgment day so you go in and you haven't slept and it's terrifying and all your peers are sat behind a row of very scary judges including your tutor and then whoever else they've brought in to judge you and they're all sitting there very difficult to please I guess kind of like x factor or the voice or something yeah. like this yeah it feels like that and Basically, we just prepared ourselves to get ripped apart because it's um, at this particular school, it was really hard to get the approval of these people. They had such high standards and they were more likely to, to give you that tough love. Mm -hmm. um, so I got up there and I was fully ready to hear things like, this is rubbish, this, isn't, this, isn't, this is not strong, you should have tried this or you should have tried that or like this is weak that's weak uh, and I was shocked I got up and I pushed my mannequins in and my tutor was like this is beautiful and I was like what what dimension is this <laughs> did I am I still sleeping did I sleep last night um, and what that showed me was that okay maybe this lack of this lack of focus on the technicalities on the methods on the exact ways on the history of pattern cutting the reason they don't teach you how to do that is because what they want to encourage in you is for you to find your own way to do it 
Because when you don't know the rules, you choose your ingredients. You just kind of act on instinct. You start to tune into like, oh, I would like a bit of turmeric in this. I'm going to try that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try it with a bit more chili and I'm going to add some paprika. Why not? And yeah, you find your way and your own unique flavor, which isn't, it's not cookie cutter. It's not boxed up. It doesn't follow any of the rules that anybody else before you has put in place. Yeah. And it's empowering. So what if we were to take that and the next time you have the feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing, you realize like, wow, this is a great place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It reminds me of Steve Jobs. One thing, I don't know if you mentioned it now, but when you were talking to me before, you said that when you were putting together your art collection or whatever, you realized it was kind of tapping into your fashion fashion what's it called yeah yeah fashion like so the way Your fashion background yes so i'm sort of building a collection as opposed to trying to create an artistic body of work or like trying to develop a style or something more i'm taking sort of feelings and putting them together in a way mm-hmm. that like, makes sense as a collection and to me that sounds amazing even though i only half know what you're talking about yet you had that like feeling of but no one else is doing it this way yeah yeah yeah. and yet that's what the unique recipe is for you and it reminds me of Steve Jobs he studied typography and typography no calligraphy in school I think Uh, because when he dropped out he decided to only take the classes he was interested and I think he took calligraphy and Like it was just what he was interested in. He didn't know it would turn into anything with computers. But later, his background in calligraphy, if I remember correctly, helped influence something that was related to that with computers. I don't know if it was typography or something. Yeah. Yes. His eye for typography just transformed the Apple products and all the advertising that we see this kind of like beautiful considered typography that we have on all of our devices Mm -hmm. is because he honed that eye while he was studying calligraphy. Yeah. So these parts of you, they're not just like episodes and then season over. Mm. It's like part, it's part of your recipe that just keeps getting more and more evolved and delicious like, yeah. um, you noticed that two nights ago, I posted on Instagram that a picture of something I painted on Procreate. And I said, getting back into art. Yes, when I, and it was beautiful. Thank you. Well, I posted it immediately after I finished it. It took me about an hour to paint. And I took a Skillshare class to know how to do it. I was literally just like, I'm tired of wanting to get back into painting and drawing. So Mm -hmm. let me just sign up for Skillshare and take a class. So I just signed up, picked the class, started going lesson by lesson. It was very short. And halfway through, I kind of lost track of of what she was doing. And I just kind of just went my own way to finish it. And when you're making art, I'm sure you know, there's this part in the middle where it's like, I should just quit now. This is terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, what was I thinking? I should get back to work because that I was sat down thinking, okay, time to work. And then I ended up painting something. And that's the way I kind of, that happens for me every day. Like, yeah, I'll have a plan, but then my intuition says, here, try this. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> that's more fun. So, okay. And I have no, like, I don't know like why I'm doing it or how it's going to work into what I'm supposed to be doing or what I put my goal what my goals are like I like you let go of all of that mm-hmm. and so you're I'm making this art and I know because I've painted and drew before and I knew that when you keep going and you embrace the fact that it's art it ends up looking okay if you yeah. keep going and so sure enough yeah. it ended up looking great and I posted it on Instagram the next day my intuition was like hey Planner Girl Magazine, issue number three, coming up. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I went into Canva and I clicked on it and I was like, 
you know, our cover could use a refresh. 2020, new year. I never really was in love with this cover. It was just like minimal viable, get the cover done. But then I was like, let me try that piece of art I made. And I dragged it over and I was like, that's why my intuition wanted me to paint this yesterday. It yes. looks perfect. Mm -hmm. It just solidified how I want the magazine to look every quarter and made me even more excited about the magazine moving forward. I was like, that's why you follow your intuition. That's why you embrace, I don't know what I'm doing. Because I was like, I don't know why I'm painting something right now at seven o'clock in the evening when I should be doing this other thing. Yeah. And yet I was like, I'm just going to do it. And then it turned into something that's going actually going to help my goals. Like it's actually mm -hmm. going to help the things that I plan to do. So it's like, you have to have that attitude of just embracing. I don't know what I'm doing, but I feel called to do this. Yes. I love that. Oh my gosh. There's so many different ways to look at, I don't know what I'm doing. It's so mm. empowering. There's the whole, there's so, there's, you don't have any rules to hold you back. Yeah. And that feels like freedom. And then there's all the space that then, then that creates for you to put your own, to draw from all your past experiences and to create mm -hmm. something that is unique and fresh and you and not yeah. you trying to be somebody else. And then there's not needing, you don't need to know what you're doing or how it all perfectly slots into place right now. Mm -hmm. It could be that you just need to do it. You just need to follow that intuition and then it will make sense mm -hmm. that's at, at a certain works. point. Yeah. It's not, Oh, uh, my, my intuition is something that kicks in when I have the perfect plan. I know everything from A to Z. It's like it kicks in because you surrender mm -hmm. and you, you, the fact that you see the next step right in front of you is enough. It's not a series of steps all the way up the ladder. It's like the next step. It's like, oh, the next step is I feel like making art right now. Wake up the next morning, realize the next step is to use the art in the magazine. Mm -hmm. It's like that's what it feels like to go along the ride with your intuition. I had another thing that I remembered while you were talking about your story. Um, kind of embracing, I don't know what I'm doing and letting yourself be surprised if you just keep going. So I went back when I was in barista, I entered a drink competition, like a competition to make a new flavored coffee drink. Yum. <laughs> and it was held at this hotel, very fancy, lots of people there, like lots of people coming in from different restaurants and schools to make their, you know, their comp competitive drink and lots of people who came in to try everything and they do this every year. So I entered the competition because the guy who delivers me the coffee and the f coffee flavors was like, Hey, you should enter this competition. Cause I was always like coming up with new flavors. And mm. you know, when I came back from Paris, I made the Paris latte and I was like always making up something new. What's in the Paris latte? I think it was raspberry and white chocolate. <laughs> <sighs> Maybe this needs to be the recipe for the next magazine. Ooh. And that's I where like I started that. tinkering with graphic design because I had to make my own posters and my own little coffee cards. That was the very, 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 very beginning of me tinkering with graphic design. Yeah. So... Um, Wow. You told me that I should your, so your, your graphic design career began with a latte making competition. Yes. Well, kind of before that, it kind of, I think it kind of began after I came back from Paris. Yeah. If, if, if you want to change your life, go to Paris. <laughs> um, so I entered the competition and I came up with a recipe called Spice Cake Caramella. It was caramel, chai, espresso, milk, ice, um, and a cupcake flavor. What What is cupcake flavor? How do you it, get cupcake it's, flavor? It's the, it's the syrup that says cupcake. Uh -huh. we it's from use... the magical cupcake tree that grows cupcakes. <laughs> I know. It's not healthy. <laughs> um, 
Uh, we use Pirani, which is a popular coffee syrup brand. So, you, you know, you go to these coffee shops and they have all these flavors. They're either usually using Monin or Tirani, like those are the two big ones. And so I made this cupcake caramella, spice cake caramella. And uh, when it came for time for the competition, I packed up my ice chest, this old beaten up ice chest with my bag of ice and my $20 blender and my, my espresso. And I didn't even, it's not like I could take my espresso machine with me and make fresh espresso. I had to make it and then pack it and milk. And I just took that with me with an old, with my old, like this ugly old beaten up ice chest to this hotel and we, all the contestants go into this room. So I'm looking around this room and I'm the shabbiest person there. <laughs> like I look like nobody. And I'm look and there's just like I remember the table across from me. Huge table and there's like 10, 10 people all dressed in these white chef suits and they have their teacher there and they're like they, they're coming from culinary school at the college and they're putting together they're, they're all there to put together this drink and I'm looking at like I'm doing my little thing in my $20 blender and I'm looking at them and they're like creating this huge display and there's smoke coming out and all this stuff oh like, like I'm like I should pack it up and go home oh. they've already won and so uh we submit our drinks it goes to the, to the judges who are in another room and then we have to, well, then we come out into the main area where all of the festivities are happening and the people are performing. And then it comes time to announce the winners on the stage. And I literally, I was just, I remember thinking, I'm just going to pack up and go home because I know I didn't win. And I kind of said that to the guy who invited me. He came over to me and was like, hey, how's it going? I was like, I think I'm just going to go home. And he's like, Stick around, stick around. Stick around. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of the judges. And then he goes oh, up I can, on... I can, I can sense what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> he goes up on the stage and goes through the, like, listing winners of different competitions because there's, like, pastry chefs and all these things. And then he says, the winner of the latte drink of the year... Michelle Roar! And I was what? like, what? <laughs> yes! <laughs> I was totally, totally blown away. Mm -hmm. Totally did not expect that. Like, I came in all by myself with a $20 blender yeah. and my pre-packaged supplies mm -hmm. across from people who were coming in from culinary school with their whole team and their chef suits and their smoke coming out of their cups and all this stuff. And I won. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I was doing. No. So it's, and you, like, when you made the dress, you didn't follow, like, you weren't coming from a background of all this stuff. I like, had no I wasn't idea what I was coming out of culinary school. No. I wasn't there with my teacher. I, I never even learned how to do espresso from anybody. I had to, like, look up YouTube videos and buy books that didn't really help and then just trial and error and just trying things and to, you developed your own tastes right yeah. in, in both of our scenarios it was about going okay well I don't know how to do this properly so I'm just gonna just see gonna what I fun. like I'm, I'm just, just gonna, gonna try have fun. exactly yeah. exactly and you start I'm to tap into like recipes. what looks beautiful to me or what tastes beautiful to me what mm -hmm. what is working for me what am I craving more of and you start to like look at whatever you're creating through that lens. Like, um, what do I want from this? What's, mm -hmm. what's missing? What am I, what do I need to add? Mm -hmm. And this is actually a, like, I would say the most important skill. If you can create your own taste and mm -hmm. your own yeah. sense of like, what makes this potent, amazing that yes. is what sets you apart from everybody else who may have the technical training, but they don't know how to tap into what they love. Mm -hmm. And that's where the magic is. 
And that's why when it comes to business, <clears throat> there's this initial level where you think I got to learn how to do this right. Mm -hmm. And then there's this conscious awareness, higher level where you realize I will need to learn how to do this my way my way yeah instead of the right way and it's a shift it requires you to dismantle things you grew up thinking about yourself it requires you to realize you're worthy you deserve more you're not these negative things that you've believed up to this point and you are amazing and beautiful and limitless and have this potential it's like it requires you to latch on to that the truth and to let go of the lies that you may have believed up to this point because the more you believe in the things that aren't true about yourself the more you're looking outside of yourself for the answers yeah. and the more you believe what's really true the more you realize the answers are inside and the more you, you can turn inward and hear the voice of your intuition, hear what is your style, your approach, your taste, like, and it fil filters into everything. It affects how you dress, it affects what you, like, how you eat, how you cook, how you live, how you decorate your home. You, you know, you, the more you realize that you're just an amazing person, the more that reflects on in your outer world. And Amy and I have been on that journey. Um, yeah. Even just like I was watching a old Michelle and Amy YouTube show. That's what I do in my pastime. <laughs> <laughs> I just watch my show on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, we damn, we're smart. <laughs> <laughs> Which episode did you watch? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I watched the one where you were talking about how I uh, asked you. Why do you have that sewing thing on your wall? Yeah. And we're like, I don't know. I don't want to be a seamstress anymore, whatever it was. Yeah. And now I look at your apartment. It's beautiful. It's like, I'm not, you probably should like, look, you should see the, the clutter in the corners. Like, I don't know if you have something you're hiding. I have a bunch of toys on the floor over here. But like today, I'm expecting an, a delivery of beautiful bohemian rugs. Beautiful. Oh, wow. Because I'm finally embracing the interior decorating style that I really would like love to cultivate. Like yes. I'm getting to know myself in that area more. Yes. Like I've decluttered things in my house that don't reflect the life I want to live. And I'm bringing in the things that reflect who I am, what my style is, what I like. Mm. And I'm sure the same thing is happening for you in your home because I don't see sewing equipment in your house anymore. No, you don't. You don't see. No, exactly. Actually, yes, I've been on a journey of also bringing in more of what really brings me energy. And so it's patterns and it's color. And through going through this uh, moment of like redecorating the house and bringing in beautiful things, it has like sparked that that need to create art again like mm -hmm. and this time it's clear because i got clear on like what it was that i needed to see in my surroundings in order to bring me energy lift my spirits and so when it came to okay time to make art time to start building a store and a way for people to come in then there was no question about it it was like well I'm just going to resume making <laughs> patternful, colorful things. It's like mm -hmm. the way that you express yourself in one area of your life, it kind of trickles in to everything else. Yeah. So this, this alignment is really important. Yeah. <clears throat> and it starts with surrender and let go mm -hmm. because that kind of like opens your, your hands to let things leave but also let things come in and in the SOS club we have been decluttering <clears throat> because because we're going into a new decade and because this is a time of taking on new goals and dreams first we want to make room make space like get let go and surrender in order for our intuition to come out and be heard yeah. <clears throat> and and so be trusted. Always, 
and be trusted. Good. Yeah, it does yeah. require a trust. Like to let go, if you've been holding on to things in your surrounding, like one of the things it can signify is you don't trust that if you donate this box of stuff, that you, if you had a need for it again, you could go out and buy it without it being a big deal. Like I can declutter this thing that I have not used in six months because if I do need it sometime in the coming year, I can just go out and buy it. Like that requires trust, trusting that there's abundance, trusting that there's not this, that your sense of there being scarcity and you have to hold on to everything, that that's not true. Like trust, totally. Trusting so yeah, it's been a journey of decluttering lately. The abundance thing is huge. And also trusting that your cravings are valid. So what you need right now is valid. You don't need to hold on to these things. Like if you, it was hard to let go of all the past version of me, the fashion version, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let go of all that equipment. But it's been a process of like learning to trust that, okay, but what I want in this next phase doesn't include that. And that's okay. Yeah. Like it's, trust, it's more than trust, okay. It's valid. Yeah. Trusting that your future is always going to be bigger than your past. Mm. That's how you let go. Like my future is bigger than my past. I can let go of things in my past because they're not as great as what's coming to me. They're not as good. They're not as amazing. They're not as wonderful, as wonderful as it may have been. It's not as great as what's coming to me. And if I'm going to receive what's coming to me, I have to let go of the past because it's the past. Mm -hmm. Can't yes. do both. <laughs> yes. I, I just want to go back to the trust thing. Like talking mm -hmm. about, so we talk a lot about intuition, listening to your intuition, but a huge part of acting on intuition is trusting that intuition, trusting that, you can make decisions. Mm -hmm. this, this comes up for me a lot. And like it's coming up for me a lot in this phase of life where I'm learning to be the creative director of my life. Like that's mm -hmm. what I've decided. I'm going to be the creative director of my life. And that involves trusting in my own decisions. So one of the things that I did to try and infuse myself with the energy of this like bold creative director was I, I purchased some books to get inspired and one of them of course I don't have it in arm's length because I'm not that prepared but is called um, The Eye and mm -hmm. it is by the, pub, pub, uh, the publishers that do Kinfolk magazine if you know the mm, magazine, I've heard of it beautiful and it's a book all about creative directors from all sorts of different industries, publishing and uh, fashion and art and all sorts of different creative industries. And as I'm reading through, they all have completely different paths. They all have done things in totally different ways to each other, but built something magnificent. And what comes through all these interviews, all these profiles is a deep trust in themselves, in their values, mm -hmm. in what they see as the way to move forward, even if it doesn't fit with what everyone else around them was doing, even if there aren't any role models, there weren't any role models at the time to tell them like, yes, this works, this is your formula, go ahead. And so becoming the creative director of your life then means taking decisions that come from a place of like, I, I don't necessarily need to do it their way. I'm, I'm craving this. I'm needing this. I'm, I'm, there's something pulling me towards this direction and these are my values and this is how I'm going to spin it and re really going with it, not kind of making a decision and then going back on it and then making mm -hmm. a decision. That, no, they go full force with that decision. Whatever you decide, you can make it work somehow. Mm -hmm. yes <clears throat> now I was just thinking about why is it that people don't think that way I think uh I mean there's there's an element of like for me personally 
growing up and going to through the school system, the traditional schooling system that sort of teaches you there is a right answer and a wrong answer. There's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. Like if you were to, if I were to start turning my page upside down and writing diagonally, somebody would tell me, no, that's the wrong way to do it. Turn it back around. But maybe mm -hmm. not. Like the way you choose to use your paper is like, it could be the perfect way for you and you've come up with a new way of thinking. But mm -hmm. The system doesn't does encourage that, doesn't encourage you to see the world in a new way. There is a brilliant book that was one of the first books I read when I started my Take Responsibility for My Life journey. And I'm going to look it up on my Audible. That talks about exactly this, letting people be their own creative genius instead of forcing everyone to act the same way and do the same thing mm -hmm. okay it's the element by ken robinson it's called the element how finding your passion changes everything and he did a brilliant ted talk which was also super hilarious i watched it multiple times and i'll link it we'll link it <laughs> in the description and he tells real stories of people who just weren't wired to fit in. Mm. And nobody's wired to fit in. But no. for some people, it's extra obvious and difficult. And when they're allowed to just go their own way, they become superstars. Mm. Maybe in a big national way or in a quiet personal way. And he t one of the stories that I always remember is he, there was a little girl who could not stop moving. Like she was always disrupting the classroom. The teachers were like, we can't get her to sit still. We got to And the mom took her into this doctor or somebody to find out how can I get my kid to stop fidgeting and moving and sit still and listen in the classroom. And he was just, I guess, a very intuitive doctor. And he said, he, he asked the mom, to come out of the room with him and leave the girl there by herself. And before they left, he turned up a song on the radio and they're outside of the room. And then they look in the window and the girl gets up and just starts dancing. And he told her, your daughter needs to move to think. Mm. And he said, put her in dance school. And she went on to become, I think, the creator of the Cats, the musical, the, the, wow. the Broadway dance musical. And that's like one of the biggest musical or dances or whatever it is of all time. I've never seen it, yeah. but I've always heard of it. And I think they even just made a new movie out of it recently. That was her. What if they medicated her? Mm -hmm. What if they put her on something to get her to sit still and be quiet and listen? She never would have gone on to do what she did. And I think all of us have that girl inside of us. And all the layers that we need to peel back to let that girl go her own way. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing here. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that book. Everyone read it. Read it. There's certain books that changed my life. That is one of them. Yes. Let me just go and grab that book that I was talking about to you. Mm-hmm. Back in the eye. Ooh, yeah. So the the thread that links together all these amazing creative directors, and it's it's this gorgeous book, all in black and white, beautiful photography, mm -hmm. just just gorgeous, like very inspiring. Lots of very incredible creative people, and the thread that is running through it is that these people have developed their eye, their taste, what they, what lights them up essentially. Mm. And they've threaded that into whatever they've created, their art, their business, their relationships, everything. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what it takes, not a formula, not mm -hmm. knowing how to do things, but really tuning into what is that that energizes you and then infusing everything with that. Mm -hmm. And nobody can tell you how to do that. Actually. Exactly. 
I know sometimes I get questions like, how do I do, or I'm, I need to do this. How do I do it? Or what would you do if blah, blah, blah. It's like, let's start with nobody knows better than you. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows better than you. I can give you an answer, but I don't know. Like the answer is, you know, and I'm a part of Tanya Lee's Slim Seek and Savvy coaching program. And recently I see like, she has a Facebook group and people are, posting how they're progressing with what she's teaching them but once in a while someone would would post like I don't know what to do I blah 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 my husband and it was like all of this like crying out for help like tell me what to do and then of course a bunch of women would comment you should do this you should do that and that's fine but I noticed Tanya she put up a post and she said ladies I want you to remember that you actually know what to do. Mm -hmm. Do not, like you can come and ask for support and help, but to come from a place of, I don't know what to do. And it's a negative thing. It's not like, I genuinely don't know what to do. So like, let's try anything. Let's experiment. There's no right or wrong. It's like, I don't know what to do. I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. I'm lost. I'm, I'm worthless. Someone else it's going to save the day for me. It's like to come in with that kind of energy. It's like, that's not what she teaches. Yes. Do you know a question that I found really helps to move on as the next step from the statement? I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. A question I've been asking myself lately is what is your heart asking for? Mm. What is your heart asking for? What do you, what are you craving? What is, what is that answer that bubbles up? Then yes. you might not be like, uh, you know, it, it might not be an answer that you want to share with the entire world. It might be just something that you really need to deal with for you. Mm-hmm. And it's about listening to that and not making that wrong, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. So in this moment, mm-hmm. Amy, what do you want to do? I just want to make lots and lots. I, you know, I have, since I committed to making Amy, this Amy, that's the wrong answer. Oh, what? You want to finish your meatballs and eat a fantastic dinner. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I want to do that too. I want to do that too. What's the cause yeah. thing you want to do? What do you do, want to do right now? <laughs> mm, yes. What is your heart asking for? Because I think that's true. Because when you listen to those little moments of like, I want to go take a walk, or I want to buy a bohemian rug, damn it. Or (laughs) (laughs) it's like, that is almost no different from you wanting to pursue art. Yeah. Like, it's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. You're expressing yourself. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right now, I want to go make some homemade whole wheat bread, roast some red bell peppers, and make a mozzarella basil roasted red bell pepper homemade fresh whole wheat bread sandwich. Oh, that sounds divine. (laughs) Oh my goodness. With like some sea salt sprinkled on top and maybe like a pinch of chili flakes. Like, oh Oh, man, give me the ideas. (laughs) (laughs) I remember the, the first time I learned how to, this is a side note. We're all here for side notes, right? So the first time we should I call I, this the side note the show. The side note <laughs> show. The no real straight path show. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. The first time I learned how to roast peppers, it was uh, a neighbor of ours a few doors down. She's she was French. She is French. She we used to live near this French lady who when I was seven years old, she, she uh, taught me some French and she would make me these hot chocolates and have a croissant and we would do French. It was wonderful. And uh, her mother taught, me how, taught us how to roast bell peppers in the simplest, most French way. Just chop them up and drizzle olive oil lavishly and then sprinkle some sea salt. Roast. Enjoy. Like the simplicity of that and like that has You know what's funny? Yes. The reason yeah. I love roasted red bell peppers is because it reminds me of my visit to France. Yes. To Paris. I think it's a French thing. 
Yeah. Like the smell of it makes me like I'm back in walking the streets of Paris. Mm. Yes. So go and roast some bell peppers, everybody. <laughs> Just so it's so it up. It's so funny. I it to this French lady. It's like, I do it because of France. Yes. <laughs> yes. Cool. Okay. So we got off track. Um, yes, I, I would like to ask everybody, like, what is your heart asking for? What are you craving? And just give yourself permission to do some journaling on that sometimes. And, and you don't have to show anybody. This is a very private thing. Like you can just mm -hmm. put whatever you need down on that page and try not to be afraid of it and start mm -hmm. to entertain the idea that like, okay, maybe I could make space for this. How could I start to incorporate a little bit of whatever is in there? Whatever yeah. is start practicing listening to your heart your intuition your inner voice and yeah i'm hungry now so please let us know how you love this episode after we've taken such a long break let us know how much you missed us and how you love this and how you <laughs> want us to make sure we don't leave for so long again <laughs> we love to hear from you we so, love to hear. Okay, and we do this for you. We we yes, we do this for ourselves because we wouldn't have these talks anyway. But press and record, putting all this on YouTube is for you. So we hope you're enjoying it. Yes. You don't have to know what you're doing. The end. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.